Hello and welcome to this live. Thank you so much for joining me. And um, yeah, thank you for yeah, being interested in actually what I do and uh, about the article. I hope as well that you found interesting in The Guardian. It was um, a lot of fun and always uh, a great pleasure for me to be asked to talk about my passion and my story, what I like to do. And I never take these things for granted. I actually am always amazed that people will want to hear uh, something I've got to say. So I I never take those things for granted ever. And, um, and anybody that watches me regularly, I, I hold these sessions, if you're new to this, I hold these sessions every week, in fact, and started doing them through uh, the whole pandemic. And so you're very, very welcome to join regularly. If you have questions about language learning, if you want to talk about things that are important to you, then you're very, very welcome. Um, for this session, obviously, I want to talk about the article that came out uh, just on Friday. And clearly, uh, there's a lot in there. And uh, I, I got a lot of questions about it, about you know, the whole from, and I've used the title of the article deliberately in this live stream um the you know speaking 50 or more than 50 languages and those of you who know me know that clearly i would never <laughs> myself write or say that um about my own ability uh, simply because i'm a great believer in allowing individuals to judge whether or not i speak the languages and um, the only one thing that i can say that is objectively true is that i've studied more than 50 languages over my lifetime uh, so far on this planet and uh, that's just something that I can explain quite easily because people do often ask um, how is it possible that you can study over 50 languages well languages actually uh, start to rack up very quickly when you start looking into language families so that's to say languages that are similar or related so let's take for example the Germanic family so in the Germanic family, you have languages like English, Dutch, German, Swedish, Danish, Norwegian, Icelandic, Faroese, Luxembourgish, and Afrikaans, 10 languages, all of which I've studied uh, to some degree. And so before you even start getting to 50, you've got 10 just in one language family, and those languages clearly are similarly related. And so once you do that, and my three language family specialities are um, the Romance languages, the Germanic languages, and the Slavic languages. So they're the ones that I've studied most, and they're the ones that um, I use at home as well, those languages from those uh, language families. So when you sort of take that out of the equation, and then you're left with other languages that I've, I've done courses in at university, and different things, as you saw from the article, um, very quickly you get to that number 50 plus um, without really uh, you know, sort of going into sort of doing really very different languages. So the number, yes, it's in, important in that it shows that I've studied a number of different languages and I, I enjoyed each of those languages on their own merit. It's not that I just raced through them to, to rack up numbers. It's uh, been a long process of studying many courses, even my degree as in languages and things like that. But um, also just enjoy languages. Um, I'm seeing some nice hello messages, so hello to everyone joining, thank you so much. Um, really appreciate the support and also the kind words and uh, the genuine questions. And uh, so what I want to do is I do have a number of questions that are already pre-asked and uh, a lot of these came through Instagram, but I also had a few um, on, uh, on the back of the article. And so, yeah, some of them were you know how do you how do you how do you study like for, for 50 languages it's a crazy number and one of the one of the other questions do you speak 50 languages well look i mean there are only so many hours in the day so how many languages do you get to practice and use and so it, it becomes quite challenging to be um, able to speak uh, any given moment in all 50 um, straight away so i don't really know of anyone who has done that in the past I've heard of stories, but I've never actually heard anyone do it. And I do think that um, in being in the language learning community and having been in that community for many, many years, um, I think we would have seen 
more evidence of that of people feeling very very confident in like 50 odd languages speaking them very confidently just at a moment's notice and um, more often than not what i see with other people who um, enjoy lots of languages is they have periods where certain languages feel a bit rusty because they've not been using them for a longer time and also because um, clearly if you're practicing one that's similar to another then there can be interference so um, all of those things you know sort of feed into your ability to say speak a language then you have the added problems of what does it mean to speak a language and this makes it quite difficult <laughs> because people will often have different ideas as to what it means to speak a language people also have different ideas of what fluency means and we got a number of questions as well about fluency do you, which languages do you speak fluently well again difficult to say my broad definition of fluency is that you could study and learn and maybe work through the language and um, i think Generally speaking, that's a, a fairly good benchmark, but even that is quite a difficult thing to pinpoint when you're talking about languages that are similar to ones you already speak. And the reason why that's difficult is that you could probably understand them to learn to that level without being at what would even be agreed as a fluency level, perhaps, in the language. Take me with Slovak. I could probably sit and learn a lot of stuff through Slovak. I could, I can definitely watch TV. I can um, enjoy a lot of things through Slovak. But am I fluent in Slovak? Absolutely not. And I would never ever say that I'm even anywhere near it. In fact, right at this moment in time, I would not be able to even have a proper conversation with anyone in Slovak. Um, so. I like to be as upfront and as transparent as I possibly can when it comes to what I can and what I can't do and what's humanly normal and possible and what's sort of extraordinary in terms of uh, abilities. And let's be frank, we're all flesh and blood and there are limits and limitations to things. But the, the important thing, I think, is that we explore things, we learn, we continue, we grow, we adapt, we meet different people and we learn about different places, cultures and languages. And there's a lot of fun in doing that because you don't just get that experience, as I said, in the article of building bridges, but also you have um, these connections of etymology and sometimes historical um, links and ties with neighbouring countries that I find absolutely fascinating. So you learn lots of really, really cool things. Now, I do want to go through some of the questions I have here. I've got a couple of pages of questions. They're not that long, so hopefully I will be interesting in giving the response. And maybe there's some of the questions that you have yourselves. So let me start at the very first one that I got, which was, can you teach me German? <laughs> OK. And if there's a course that I have, I don't sell anything in particular um, at the moment. Um, maybe one day I will develop a course or uh, a product or something. But at the moment, I don't. Um, what I do is I do run language learning uh, therapy sessions for people. And what that does is it talks through the individual's need for language learning. And you can do that via my Patreon page if you want to get in touch. It's on my website, speakingfluently.com. Feel free to have a look. Uh, otherwise, I do these sessions for free, obviously, um, every Sunday. And uh, yeah, anyway, have a, have a look if you're interested in that kind of thing. Um, how do you set up your language learning plan? How do you split time between languages? Well, that's actually not something I give that much thought to. Um, I've got to a point now with my language learning that I am very, very, very happy to accept that I'm a human being and that I will forget and things will get rusty and that's absolutely fine. So if a language is not one that I come into contact with on a very uh, natural, sort of in a natural way in my daily setting, then I'm, I'm not really worried. So I have done projects like Latvian, for example, and Finnish, where I studied them for several months and then even went to the countries and studied them for a, a time there too. And then came back and never really had much contact with the language. And I just have to accept that there are limitations to the amount of hours I have in the day, other things I need to do, um, other things I have in my life that I have to attend to. And so I accept that they may get rusty. What I do is I do language projects nowadays. So I will take a language that I 
field that I'm, I'm interested in and want to learn more about. So the last couple of years, I um, have been focusing more on the Celtic languages. Uh, I've been studying Cornish, as I mentioned in the article too, and Irish, in fact, uh, for the last maybe year Irish. And then before that, I did a year of uh, Scottish Gaelic. Um, and the reason why I am doing those is because um, that's my background is from those islands where those languages are spoken and um, I speak Welsh so uh, learning Cornish for me felt like a, a nice challenge to do with a friend and then I just continued doing it um, and now I've got some friends online that I speak to regularly in Cornish and I, I listen to the language fairly regularly so I, I enjoy it and so sometimes I find that a language will end up having a community attached to it that I can access very easily and therefore want to continue and can continue without much effort. Other languages, it's um, it's sometimes trickier to maintain that without making a huge effort. And when I say huge effort, it means that I have to uh, remember and consider to take time out of my day to go to certain sessions or certain groups or reach out to people. And that can be tricky when you're talking about multiple languages. So um, what I do is I tend to go to classes. I like classes. I like language um, exchange type things or language groups where I can use language and practice language. My, the best thing for me definitely is when I can use a language in a very natural uh, way without having to make huge uh, sacrifices or changes to my routine. Um, I like to be able to integrate languages into my life. And that's basically how I've done it. Next question I have is, what was it like being an au pair? Absolutely wonderful, a wonderful experience being an au pair. Um, I was an au pair for three young girls uh, in Germany and they were just the most wonderful children and the family was absolutely wonderful. We're still in contact, um, however many years later, what, 23 years later, we're still in contact. And um, that was a very special time in my life where not only did I learn the language, but I also uh, built very strong relationships with, with people from the community and um, learned an awful lot of life lessons as well. It was great, including things that helped me prepare for being a father later. So yeah, absolutely wonderful experience being an au pair. Um, and totally by accident too. I didn't go over to be an au pair in Germany. I was actually asked by the family because we got on so well to be that kind of au pair role. So yeah. <laughs> um, do you have a favorite language to use with family? Well, the, fam the language that we mostly use is Macedonian because that's the language I use at home with my wife and, and with my daughter when we're at the table. Very often the default language will be Macedonian. Um, I don't particularly have a favorite as such, but um, that would be the most common one that I would use at home. Um, how many languages does your daughter speak now? Still the five, so I didn't add any other languages. She's shown interest in a couple of other languages over the years, but um, she actually likes mathematics and, um, and computer science. So yeah, um, I don't force languages on her and uh, definitely wouldn't want to make another mini me. That's not ever been my uh, goal in life or uh, something I think that the world needs. Um, so I just let her choose what she wants to do and she does her own thing. I just literally just spoken to her in the four languages that I used and the one obviously my wife used and that was it. And as far as I'm concerned, that's fine. She didn't, then can decide what she wants to do. She's um, a bright, strong young lady, so she can decide what she wants to do in life. Um, why did the boys think that you might speak Norwegian? So these are the boys that were on holiday in Spain and they ran up to me and they asked me in English, actually, do you speak Norwegian? And possibly that was one of the only phrases they knew. Um, and my guess is that um, as a child, I was very blonde uh, with blue eyes. And so um, I possibly looked like I could have been from Scandinavia too. So um, people often do think that I'm from Scandinavia or someone like that so um, I do get mistaken for a Scandinavian and so I'm imagining that they saw somebody who looked similar to them and and, and just assumed that I might be Norwegian. Um, yeah. 
if you have the chance, will you learn Basque, Escoda? So I had tried starting Basque at one point. It was just I picked the wrong time and I had to reevaluate and go back and say, OK, look, I have other things I need to concentrate on. But um, I would like to learn Basque, yes, absolutely. In fact, um, something quite special about Basque that I'll share with you. Um, I was friends with Alan King, who came to speak at Polyglot Conference in Thessaloniki. Um, sadly, he's passed away now, but he has written many books on the Basque language and is also from the United Kingdom. And um, he really encouraged me to, to sort of get more into um, indigenous, endangered and vulnerable languages and even um, projects that would help to promote uh, waking up or re-reviving um, languages that had um, no native speakers left, um, no community where they were regularly spoken or uh, in fact were maybe struggling um, in some way but often he would uh, look at languages particularly in Central America. Um, he was he was looking at Honduran Lenca for example and I got involved for a time in that project um, but yeah, I would like to learn Basque. Uh, I felt quite inspired by him uh, and the work that he did. So absolutely, yes. In fact, he's, if you look on colloquial, Basque is a language, is the book that he wrote as well um, on Basque to teach people. Okay, how can I develop listening? Any skill that you want to develop is developed by doing it. So um, very often people will say, well, I, you know, I, I read a lot. So how do I speak? When you speak, you have to speak. And if you want to develop your listening, you have to listen. Uh, there are certain ways you can do that. Um, so certain pointers that I'll give you if you're finding listening difficult are making sure you listen to the same or very similar types of content um, over and over again, that you're not listening to a plethora of different people uh, when you're just starting out with listening to a language. The reason is, is that when you listen to a particular show or a particular variety of la the language or particular speakers, in fact, um, they will have their own idiolects, their, their types of words and phrases and things that they, they prefer. And so they will use those words over and over again. So you get the experience of understanding a speaker or group of speakers um, first. And then what you do is you can start diverging into other people who use the language and you'll start to hear that, the, yes, there are commonalities, but also there are things that they say that are different. And they say things differently because they're different people and they use the language or prefer certain words in the language over others. And so you find and this is the, the, when, when we when we learn a language, we'll often feel that we've got somewhere because we've maybe had one or two partners that we've spoken to regularly, like maybe a teacher, maybe a partner, maybe in a family or a group you feel very very confident and then what happens is you go to a place where other people speak the language and all of a sudden you don't quite get everything they say and you think oh, have i forgotten everything or haven't i learned it properly or maybe i'm a lot worse than i was or than i thought i was and you almost have this sort of panic or crisis of uh, confidence right and i i hope you can um understand what I'm what I'm saying in, in, in this respect in terms of uh, you, you've had this type of experience. I don't know what I have. And the thing it tends to be down to is you're listening to other people's idiolects and they often use these words that you're not used to. And it just takes time for you to get ready to get it takes time to get um, your ear adjusted to that pattern of speech uh, instead of the one that you, you've been used to. And so all you need to do is just take the time to expand out your listening repertoire. Um, I found that that's really helped. Other things you can do are sort of listening and reading at the same time. Um, so you, using audio books with the books or um, using podcasts with um, sort of things that you can read to the actual transcript of what they're saying, um, using subtitles and listening, but subtitles in the language. So you're sort of training both things and listening out. You can then also do little activities like listening for the differences between what's being said and what's been written. Very often with subtitles, uh, there will be a discrepancy between the two things. Um, so you, you will find that quite an interesting task, I hope. So I hope that helps uh, with your listening. What do you answer when people ask you, why are you learning Arabic or any other language? Well, my, my answer is actually different for each language, if I'm honest. Um, so if someone were to ask me, uh, why are you learning a language? And obviously there's kind of a, a judgment sometimes with this, like, why are you learning Cornish? 
I, I've had that question a few times. Well, for a few reasons. One, um, it's uh, an indigenous language from where I'm from, from the United Kingdom. Um, also, uh, it's a sister language to Welsh, and I often find that learning languages within a family uh, actually helps to bolster your awareness and ability and range in the other languages of the same family that you already speak. The other reason is that it's a language that's being revived, and I believe in the people who are reviving it, and I believe in the people who are uh, trying to get it more commonly spoken. Um, they've done a fantastic job so far, and um, they've got a number of people who are speaking it, and even as a first language. And so um, you know, why, why would I not want to help with that, uh, particularly when it's from uh, the islands where I originate from? So. Um, that would be one reason, for example, for a language like Cornish. Other languages might have different reasons. I mean, I am a particular fan of um, emboldening and, and sort of raising the voices of people uh, from, uh, you know, indigenous, endangered and vulnerable language communities, uh, simply because I think they can be overlooked. Sometimes people can say, well, there's no point in speaking them, no one speaks them, or um, why not just speak English, French, Spanish, or another colonial language that... Uh, is typically favoured and seen as more economically viable and more useful. Um, and my reason for that is that actually we are more than just economic money-making beings. We are beings with very different characters, very different motivations and very different drives. And connecting with one's roots and one's heritage is actually quite a deep um, thing. Uh, it can you can feel it as a spiritual thing. You can feel it as a, a psychological uh, thing that you do to feel uh, that you've almost a nod to ancestors or to feel complete or to feel whole. People describe it in many different ways, but there are definitely positive psychological benefits to learning these types of languages and using them, not just learning them just for fun, but actually using them. So for those kinds of languages, absolutely. Also, the other thing is, is it doesn't really matter which language it is that you learn. I know that it sounds a bit silly for many people who are kind of new to this idea or concept and you're learning a language or you're learning your first or second languages. Sure, pick whichever language you want and there's no judgment on my part if you pick, um, I don't know, um, Spanish ahead of Irish and you're from Ireland and you um, only speak English. There's no judgment on my part um, in terms of you, you didn't go for Irish first, you should because you're Irish. I would never say that. I would always say that it has to be what you feel is right for you at a given time. You may later feel that you want to reconnect with Irish if you're from Ireland or uh, Gaelic or Scots or um, Cornish or Welsh or North Sar Northern Sami, whatever language it is that you want to reconnect to, you may well do that later in life, and you're completely fine to do that. The language isn't really going anywhere necessarily. Um, but what I would say is, even if you, let's say you are from Ireland and you decide that your first language is going to be Irish, that you really want to get it and speak it well, what does it do that helps you for other languages? Well, Basically, you learn to use a different code, a different set of vocabulary and a different grammar to express what's in your brain. And what that does is it helps you uh, understand that there's there are certain differences and certain things that you have to let go of in the one language you speak to do that in another language. And that concept and understanding that in a really detailed way to the point that you can communicate in that other language means that you are also then prepared uh, mentally to take on any other language that comes because you have already been through that process once. So whether it's a language like Irish that you have a connection to, or whether it's a language like Esperanto, which is, um, you know, a, a a language that was made up for international communication in what was it, the 1800s. Uh, whether you use one or the other or something else as a base language, it doesn't really matter. The language itself actually has that benefit. So why are you learning a particular language could be those reasons. The other thing is that, you know, why not? And so often my, my thought is, why do anything? I mean, you, know, you could use this sort of why do anything for pretty much any topic or thing that you do in life, right? I mean, why bother being a doctor? Why study medicine? And you're like, well, it helps people. Okay, yeah, but they're going to die anyway. So why bother? 
<laughs> it's like it's it becomes that ridiculous when you start going too down the rabbit hole of why do things you do things because you want to because it brings you pleasure because you feel a connection to it because you have a positive benefit yourself because you want to connect to certain people because you want to travel because of whatever it is you want to do you can do what you want to do because you want to do it and the intrinsic value of doing that is actually in the activity itself and in the fruits of your labor when you actually get to a point where you can you can pick the fruit taste it it tastes good and you feel like you're enjoying that moment every time you bite into the fruit and that's why um, I would study any language because it's a fruit to bite into with a different taste every time and it's super super enjoyable um so yeah <laughs> how long does it take you usually to learn a language wow <laughs> that's a difficult question that's a, a question that requires quite a bit of um of understanding so the first thing is that it depends on the language so I, I mentioned in the article obviously if it's a language of that's strongly related to other languages I already speak, then clearly I have a bit of a leg up because maybe I know I'm familiar with the grammar, the, the type of grammar that that language uses. Maybe the vocabulary is very similar. So I have this kind of help to start speaking in the language very quickly. Um, and that was definitely the case when I took on a Slovak learning challenge um, a few years ago. And I, within a few weeks, I could start communicating things. OK, my Slovak was heavily Czech. Polish influenced, but it was it was Slovak, and I, I gave a presentation in Slovak, and and did fine in that. But what happened afterwards is I learned it quickly uh, for that purpose, and read through the books very quickly. I could almost read them like novels because it was noticing differences in languages rather than learning an entirely new concept and entirely new vocabulary. So what happened was after that happened, I didn't use my Slovak again. Slovak very quickly went back into my Czech and Polish and it was no longer an active language I could use. So yes, I can learn something potentially that would be quite quick. Would I normally do that? No. Um, normally I would uh, take more time over it because that's what stays in your brain. Um, you need to cycle through vocabulary quite a lot for it to become truly internalized and um, fossilized in your brain so that you can use it in the long term. Um, I've done similar things with other languages like Estonian that's not related, but if you study a language like Estonian like I did, I, I did that full time. So that was four hours a day and then thinking about it, obviously, and listening to things in Estonian in the evening, too. And so that was almost like a full time job for a couple of months. And, and then I did an interview on TV in Estonian and okay, it wasn't amazing, but it was it worked. It, it did its job. Do I now speak Estonian to the same level? No, probably not, because um, it, it was very, very quick. That I, it was a very quick amount, you know, sort of very fast learning process and then all of a sudden not using it again as you can imagine in the Balkans and in the UK and different places that I've been uh, over the past year um, we don't really hear Estonian spoken very often so yes you can learn a language fairly quickly you can if you do it really intensively but is it worth it mm, depends only if you're going to use it I learned German in that way in a very short amount of time uh, but I then went on to work in German, study in German, and so I was using it constantly, so it stayed in my head. Um, other languages I've done that for haven't in the same way. So yes, that's the, the kind of long answer. Uh, the short answer would be how long is a piece of string? <laughs> it really depends on, on, on so many things. But yes, that's kind of how it is with um, uh, the language learning. Okay, how do you fund it all? Language learning is so expensive. Very good question. Um, so most of my learning actually has been at university. And remember, I am of the generation from the United Kingdom where I basically grew up and most of my adult life has been as a European Union citizen. So only until recently, I haven't had access to the same types of benefits of being a European Union citizen that I had before. So I was doing university courses in Sweden online free of charge as, an, as a European Union citizen. So I studied uh, the, the things that you, you see in the article where I say I studied in Sweden. That was all free. Um, and I had access to that however I wanted. So I did, I did a number of years like that. 
Um, I also studied in Czech Republic and I did um, a, an advanced diploma there. Again, it was part of the EU, so um, easy to get in, not particularly expensive. Um, I did that while I was waiting to start a job. Um, other jobs that I've done have been in different countries, so I've lived in I think, probably nine different countries. And, and so when I live in different countries, I tend to learn the languages that are around me. And that's been a good way of learning languages, um, not particularly spending very much money doing it. I do a lot of self-study. Um, I'm not sure where you're from, Chris, you asked this question. I'm guessing this might be because you might be from a country where you have you don't have that freedom in the same way as, as I did as a, as, as a European Union citizen during most of my life. Um, and, and, and so, I, yeah, it, it could be that, but it, it wasn't expensive because the, op the opportunities were just there on a plate for anyone, not just me, uh, for anyone to do. And, um, and so I was just very, very lucky that I knew where to go to find them. Um, I studied Swedish at university and, um, and I've, I've, so I, I was able to study even some of my courses through Swedish in Sweden. Some of them actually were often English, but um, you, you could study in English or Swedish. And then courses I did like in Iceland, they were heavily subsidized. And so I just took time and because I've been working, um, I was working as well uh, online uh, from as soon as really it was even possible. And um, and so I've been able to, to, to travel and, and study and learn and combine a lot of things. I've done a lot of night courses as well, sort of night school, things like that. So, so yeah, as well as my own study. How many languages are you fluent in? What do you do to keep up with all the languages you don't use? I don't really do anything with the ones I don't use. I, I see that as a natural process. And if I go back and revisit a language, which I have done, um, like Indonesian is a language that I, I got to a level where I could communicate to go to Indonesia, use the language in Indonesia, came back a couple of years without using it at all, went almost back down to zero. And then during the pandemic, I started taking classes in Indonesian um, to just be able to refresh my Indonesian. So I have done that before. Um, but normally, yeah, I don't I don't worry if I want to go back to them. Once you've been to it once, it feels like you're revisiting an old friend. So it's it, it helps, basically. Um, you remember things again. Sometimes you don't. Sometimes it feels new again. But um, but yeah, most of the time it feels like an old friend. Have I ever tried studying Arabic? Um, yes. Um, three times, actually, in my life, I've uh, started learning Arabic and um Unfortunately, the uh, experience was that I, I I actually had that question twice, once in Arabic as well, and also in English. Um, and the thing with Arabic was that I started learning it to go and study at the University of Damascus. I was studying at the University of Leiden in the Netherlands um, with uh, a teacher that spoke Palestinian Arabic uh, colloquially, but we were learning MSA, uh, Fusra. And... I did that for what a year, maybe, just short of a year, maybe. I did it, and, and then I was going to go to the University of Damascus and study Arabic, um, but um, the university didn't reply to me. And it got to my my contract was finishing in the Netherlands. I was meant to move out. I was meant to start or to leave my job, and because I'd done a two year contract, and I was going to be starting a new job a year later. So I had a year basically to fill. And I decided that I was going to, this was before I went to the foreign office, and I decided I wanted to improve a language or learn a language. So I decided that I would um, learn Arabic. And that's why I started the course, because I knew this was coming. Um, got to the December of the year and uh, the end of that year. And uh, unfortunately, the, the university hadn't replied. Um, oddly, um, and then in that time, I, I end, ended up uh, going to uh, Charles University in Prague and uh, applying for a, a place there to study Czech and to improve my Czech. I thought that was a good investment because I'd already done Czech before and I'd been to Czech Republic. And so I decided that was a, a good move for me to have a, a, a Slavic language under my belt that was fairly solid. Um, and then, uh, you know, you can imagine, right, I, I ended up getting the letter from the University of Damascus to say that I'd been accepted the day I left the Netherlands. And I was like, okay, well, I can't do that now because I'd already bought my tickets and organized Prague 
And so I had to sort of wave goodbye to the, uh, the, the time and energy that I put into Arabic until that point. Um, and then a few years later, I got a job um, in Beirut. And um, unfortunately, that was in 2006. And if anybody here online knows what happened in 2006 in Beirut, that's when um, conflict broke out and Beirut was heavily bombed. And, um, and so the job was cancelled. And again, I'd been studying Arabic again and refreshing what I'd done for a couple of months. And again, the job was cancelled and I didn't go. So that was strike two for Arabic for me. And then I took a course at the university in Sweden and decided I was going to um, see if I could get involved with uh, the refugees coming over from Syria. And um, I was hoping that I'd be able to do something uh, useful. And so I started learning Arabic again um, at University of Dalarna in Sweden. I did uh, I did a semester. I went back over again for a third time. The same kinds of material I'd done before, but obviously on their course. Passed the exam, did that, and that opportunity also, unfortunately, didn't come to fruition, and I ended up having to do something else instead. So that's my story with Arabic. I hope one day to uh, get back to Arabic and um, and end up speaking it. It would be wonderful. Um, there are many, many words in Arabic that um, I know because of Macedonian and Turkish, because a lot of the, the Arabic words came through in Turkish into Macedonian and other Balkan languages. So there's a, there's a real contact with with that vocabulary uh, for a number of things that, that we see and um, speakers of the Balkan languages not, are not always aware that uh, some of the words that we use have Arabic origins or Persian origins in fact so they tend to be sort of these words that come through and you see them then in other languages like Indonesian and Swahili and it's it's super exciting to see how words flow and these sort of bridges uh, you know beyond borders appear and you can see how people yeah, how people uh, learn and uh, sort of make these connections. So, yes. <laughs> so I got to the end of the questions. I hope that I have um, not bored you to death and that you're <laughs> still with me for this. I will have a look now at the questions that I have. I'm on Instagram and YouTube. So I'm going to have a look on YouTube first because I looked at Instagram first last time and just see if there are any other questions. And also the questions I had were from um, Instagram, uh, the original ones. So it feels fair to start from YouTube. Um, hey Richard from Starbucks. Nice to see you, Tomek. I'm glad you're enjoying it uh, there in Sweden. Uh, Richard, I'm from Germany. Hello, hello. Bona sera, bona sera. Você fala português? Sim, falo. Sim. Diz da Richard, diz da Tomka. Um, let me see. Hi, Richard. Would you recommend to use more than one resource when learning a language? Depends on the language. Um, and it depends how much of a, a kind of a, a book butterfly you are. If you're going from one to the other and not focusing, then it's sometimes good to focus in on one. But um, certainly it's not the end of the world if you do. Um, I have used multiple uh, sources for language learning in the past. I do definitely like to have one that I stick to for a period of time though, just for continuity and so that I don't feel like I'm going backwards and forwards and not really covering any new ground. It's nice to have a, a feeling of moving forwards, right? So uh, for that reason, I do tend to go through a course, um, but I, I definitely do play with other courses too and read them and look into them and dip into them. But it's nice to have one that you, you follow that you're happy with. Good afternoon or morning or evening from upstate New York, USA. Hello, educated children. Nice to see you. Hello from Texas. Good morning from Japan. Wow. Good morning. Uh, you, you are the story. You <laughs> know, that's hilarious. Goedenavond um, vanuit Nederland. Goedenavond of ons. Dobry wiecher. Is kak is Nederland. Dobry wiecher. Aha. Let me see. Hello, Ms. Simcott. As a Mandarin native, I'm studying Cantonese and Korean at the same time. Fantastic. Yeah, I mean, you you will have a, a nice, you you will obviously be able to understand what I mean by you, you get a head start with certain things, right? You've got a number of words that have gone into Korean from Chinese and also Cantonese and, and Mandarin have a connection as well. Um, so you will see certain things that help you. So 
I, 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 I would be interested to know how you feel about learning them both. Do you find it confusing? Do you find it uh, fun? How, how do you find it? Obviously, Korean not being related, as in the grammar, is a very different language, but um, you, there are quite a lot of uh, Chinese words in Korean that, that um, I remember seeing when I looked at Korean too. I would just speak Czech and Slovakia, and that's what I, I did during the gathering, and it worked just fine for me. Me too, uh, Joanna. I used to just use Czech in Slovakia, and then for the just for that one um, event where I had to prepare Slovak for the competition, I did learn Slovak. And then the following year, actually, I went back to using Czech again. And then I, all I did is I started using, like, sort of top and tailing it with some Slovak courtesy words. Uh, Nech sabachi, things like that. Uh, but apart from that, yeah, just check. How important is it to read and listen uh, what you enjoy in target language? Yeah, so at the moment, I mean, I, I go through phases of doing this kind of stuff. So I, I, depending on the language I'm listening to, uh, very often I, I will watch. So, for example, I like I like Star Trek. Uh, I don't know how many of you like Star Trek, but I do. I like Star Trek. So I'm watching Voyager for like maybe the, the hundredth time in Turkish. And um, yeah, it's a lot of fun. I've watched a number of them in different languages, uh, but yeah, I, I mean, I quite like uh, that. And I can just sort of listen to it and take it in, which is great. Uh, I don't know how much it improves my Turkish, if I'm honest, but um, it's just nice listening to Turkish. I think it's a beautiful language. Um, but yeah, I think enjoying things in the language is quite is quite important. And certainly there are languages where I've I've done that a lot over the years where I've just enjoyed materials, whether it's I like songs, for example. I love music, so um I like to sing <laughs> on my own normally, but I like to sing in different languages as well. So I enjoy um you know many, many different things about learning languages. Um yeah. Hello, Richard. What's up? Greetings from Mexico. Hello, Alejandro. Nice to see you. I'll uh, hopefully see you in Mexico. We're going to be at the Polyglot Conference in Cholula in October. It would be great if you could make it. If you're already in Mexico, it's not far away. I hope. <laughs> what kind of things in a language you read after learning language? So it depends on the language. Sometimes the, the choice isn't the same. Um, so typically I, I do read things more kind of science. I like um, science stuff. I like uh, things about history and I like things about uh, sort of culture, generic sort of, you know, things that you, you, you sort of hear about society, for example. I quite, quite, like, quite like things like that. Um, but yeah, it, it, it's a wide range. But also in terms of actually reading about language itself, I, I mostly enjoy reading about language and um, when I when I do read. So Yes, it's a mix, but I don't read so much literature. Sorry, all the literature buffs out there. I don't, I don't read that much literature. I tend to read more, um, yeah, non-fiction stuff. The language therapy sessions are wonderful to attend. Thank you, Tiffany. I'm glad you like them. It's wonderful having you with us. It's nice to not only get help with struggles, but to meet with other learners as well. Yeah, I really, really like the dynamic in those groups. They're just wonderful. Uh, Martin, hello. <laughs> nice to see you. Um, okay, I see. You. Hey, I studied Breton for a while. I have, I haven't kept it up, but it's still very much worthwhile learning. Absolutely, jo Joanna. I didn't know you'd done Breton actually. That's really cool. Um, Richard, buenas tardes. A partir de cuál nivel piensa que podemos decir que hablamos un idioma? Creo que si sabe utilizar el idioma para aprender otra cosa y trabajar. Creo que ya está bien, eh, porque como que Ya sabe defenderte bien y responder preguntas y ayudar a la gente o aprender otra cosa, pues puedes decir que hablas el idioma, creo yo. Pero depende de la persona porque siempre dicen, pues, <ríe> es que siempre tienen otras ideas, ¿no? La gente, así que, pero para mí es así. Mówisz w pięciąt jazykach, może po jednym zdaniu w każdym. Nie, absolutnie nie. Uh, Privyet, Druk. Uh, Privyet. Uh, let me see. I think the idea of doing something just because it brings you joy is so important. Absolutely, Jack. Especially in a world that's constantly trying to monetize everything. I agree. I'm so glad you agree with me too, Jack. That's great. Uh, absolutely. Okay. How many languages can one learn from scratch at the same time? Good question. Um, so, I mean, you can learn, you can try and learn however many you want. 
uh, the the only thing I'll say is that when you learn multiple languages, you divide your time uh, of actually physically studying, but also you divide your thinking capacity, the time that you have to think in the individual languages. You can't necessarily do any sort of long thought, uh, thought intensive activities in terms of thinking, how would I say this in a language, in multiple languages at the same time, usually, especially if you're considering things. Some people say they do. So I'm not going to say everyone, but some people say they do. I I can't, if I'm, if I'm focusing on trying to build a language and I'm making conversations in my head, for example, and trying to imagine how I would say things, I normally would do that in a language at a time. Sometimes what I can do is think of how that would be different in another language that's similar, but I already speak. So for example, if I'm thinking about how I would say something in Catalan, then I already know how to say it in Spanish, then I kind of try that way to, to, to compensate, right? But otherwise, um, yeah, as long as you're aware of, of, of the, the sort of what happens in terms of it will mean that you take longer learning all of the languages. So you can do it. It just uh, has an impact on the efficacy of, of the studies and um, how, how quickly you can learn and speed. Can you speak Portuguese? I think I can. Uh, I, I, my, part of my degree is in Portuguese. So I, I studied Português de Portugal, um estudado e louco. Uh, fui para o Brasil e tinha que começar a falar com o sotaque mais perto. <laughs> tal, isso. Ok, enjoyment and passion are key. Do you agree, Richard? Absolutely. Enjoyment and passion are absolutely key. Andy, yeah, I completely agree. I just finished what I think is interesting. My partner is finished. Oh, wow, Joanna. Uh, so that's the main one. I've studied many different ones depending on preferences and circumstances. I found myself in absolutely. Marvel, very nice. Thank you. Uh, el Lidil, wow, chop you there, Tashikura there, Ultra Videos, chop Tashikura there. Big Brown, da, da, da. hey Richard, any tips for how to answer the dreaded question, how many languages do you speak, yet refuse to answer it? I, I just say I let you decide. If you if you decide to speak your language, then fine. If you don't, then also fine. It doesn't actually change my reality in any way. Um, if someone represents misrepresents me or I don't agree with somebody's opinion. That's their opinion and they're entitled to it. So my sort of philosophy in life generally is you can think what you want about me. I can think what I want about you. But my right to do that stops at your nose and your right to do that for me stops at my nose. And sort of 